I'm going to take a lot of notes when we listen to Doug McMillan. Doug. Hi, everybody. I think I'm standing between you and lunch, so I'm going to try to move with some pace here. Hey, JK. Um, I'll also try to save some time for questions at the end. Terry asked me to talk about change, and I can't do that without talking a little bit about our founder. Um, Sam Walton was born in 1918. He lived through the Great Depression and learned a lot of lessons about hard work. I think he definitely learned a lesson about the value of a dollar and stretching a dollar, and I think it influenced how he thought about retail and what he wanted to accomplish with his life. And I'm going to show you just a short clip of him. It's from January of 1992. He passed away in April of 1992 after his second bout with cancer. And during this video, he talks about the company. He talks about what he describes as the secret of the company and the purpose of the company. And one of the reasons why I want to show it to you is because it's still influencing us in a really big way today. Can we please show that? And the greatest thing is that we've got ideas from all 380,000 people in the company, and that's the best part. We're all working together, and I hope we can keep it going that way. That's, that's the secret. That's the key. And if we can, why, we'll lower the cost of living for everyone, not just in America, but we'll give the world an opportunity to see what it's like to us save and have a better lifestyle and a better life a better life for all so sam's been gone a long time now but if you work at walmart um, you can still kind of feel like you're going to run into him because the the best characteristics of him as the founder are still perpetuated in the company and what i hear amongst other things in this video is that first there was a purpose and that purpose was to save people money and help them lower the cost of living, but there's an and in there that's really powerful to me, which is and have a better life, have a better lifestyle. So today in our marketing, you can hear save money, live better. And when I hear those words, I think of it as a mandate to help people, not just to save money on quality merchandise, but to do good work in areas like social, environmental sustainability, and to carry on the purpose that he started. The other thing that he said was the secret is we're all in this thing together. And Sam was a master of driving change, and he got most of his best ideas from store associates on the sales floor in the back room of our stores. He did a great job of harvesting in an analog way the very best ideas in the company because he was always in the stores with a yellow pad asking people what they thought and taking notes. So there's a bit of a DNA here that we've been trying to tap into as it relates to leading change that is about learning new information and applying it at scale and quickly, and it all comes from Sam. So if you fast forward to where we are today, Walmart ends up being a big company. We're in 27 countries. We've got over 250 million customer transactions a week, 2.2 million associates, over 11,000 stores. 58 different brand names around the world, 514 billion in revenue, and it can all go away super quick. Like it doesn't matter. And the advantages that you may think accrue to you because of scale, I would say are probably outnumbered by the disadvantages. There are things that happen like when your suppliers sell you merchandise, they really can't afford to sell you at the lowest possible cost because they've got to manage their averages. And if they do sell you at the lowest possible cost, you continue to take share and you've got too much share. So they have this way of leveling it out where Walmart ends up being the mean rather than some extreme on one side of that curve. So there are disadvantages to size and success actually can breed a resistance to change as well. So I keep this top of mind uh, you know, very frequently because I feel like we're holding on to this position that we have very loosely and the only thing that will ensure that we fulfill our purpose, help people save money and have a better life and have a business is our ability to change. And we've got a group of Walmart associates that are here today and I was in one of our stores here this morning and had a conversation with a number of our associates. One of them was named Grace Marie. And Grace, uh, Grace's job got eliminated in Walmart recently, and she had to interview and get a new job, and she was describing to me what that was like. 
as transformation happens, it's hard to change. She said, but I've been here 28 years and Walmart is my family and the one thing I've learned from Walmart is change. So I can be anywhere in the world and I can ask a group of Walmart associates, other than our purpose and values at Walmart, what's the one thing that's constant? And they will say, change. Well, that gives us a shot. That ability to adapt is what people can underestimate about big businesses, older businesses, and I would say about Walmart. So I started thinking as Terry made the request, you know, what, what are the steps that we're following to try and create this change that enables Walmart to be here for the next generation, given that people are living in different ways and definitely shopping in different ways. And the first thing that came to mind was that secret that Sam Walton was talking about, which is we're all in this thing together. So our associates, even though we have a bunch of them, to the greatest extent possible, even though some of them just started last week and some of them may be just trying to earn some money to go to college, some of them may be there in their retirement years because they just want benefits, they all have these different circumstances. But to the extent possible, we want to create a culture and a relationship with them with everything that we do so that they feel ownership in the company. Um, in this same store today, the meat manager's named Dave. And when we stopped to talk to Dave about the meat department, he shared that he's been in the meat business since the late 70s. And there was a section behind him as he was talking to me that was completely empty in the meat department. Well, you know, in retail, that's not all that cool, right? You're supposed to like be in stock. So I'm looking over Dave's shoulder the whole time, a little distracted as he's telling me about him. And I'm like, so what's up with this space right here? He said, oh, it's cleaning morning and I'm cleaning this space. And as I looked at it, it was really clean. And he was explaining how he took the fixture apart to clean the fans in the bottom of this fixture so that every week those fans would be clean so that he could display meat in the right way. That's ownership. That's attention to detail. And what we wanted to do in our first step is to make sure that our associates were in this with us. So we've been investing. We invested in wages. We've raised our starting wage rate by 50% in the last four years but we're not just trying to invest in starting wages and we don't think the conversation should be just about starting, rate, uh, starting wages. We wanna invest across the board and we really wanna drive retention, we're actually, which is what we're actually seeing now. Our associates are staying with us longer, which is super important and strategic because we need them to pick up new skills. There's more automation coming within the walls of the store and we want them to be able to learn new, uh, new tasks done in new ways. So in addition to investing in wages, we've been investing in tools, physical equipment on the sales floor, tablets and other things, and training. And around the country in the last few years, we've created 200 training academies that serve as hubs so that people can travel to a place where they can learn curriculum with their fellow associates, not only about retail and retail education, but we're teaching things like how to be a good coach, how to give good feedback, um, we're teaching empathy, we're teaching unconscious bias as it relates to diversity and inclusion, and we're trying to create a situation where our associates are growing along with us so as this transformation of jobs happen, we can retain them longer, eliminate the tasks that should be eliminated by automation and, and technology, and create new jobs comprised of new tasks for them to be able to be successful. And to do that, there's gotta be an ongoing education program. So you'll continue to, to see us invest here, but the goal is to create that kind of ownership that we saw from Dave today and an enthusiasm about the company. Second step, we had to build an e-commerce business and fast because we are behind and we were behind. So we've been investing here to drive some scale. Um, it's great that last year we grew 40%, but it's still on a small base and e-commerce still re represents a small part of our total business around the world. The investment in Flipkart in India was a big one. Um, so now we've got an even you know, greater set of capabilities in the world of e-commerce and digital than we had before to complement what we're doing in the US and we're trying to share those learnings across the company. And a lot of this growth is delivered today through the food business. Food is moving online. Um, a mobile app with pickup at store level has scaled very quickly and now we're starting to scale delivery. But it's been awesome to see strong net promoter scores and I just want to show you this one ad because it makes me laugh. We 
get an Easter egg in there. Does anybody know what that last vehicle was? Back to the future. There's a red and white pickup truck that's Sam Walton's truck at the very end of the ad. So there's a little tip of the hat to him at the end, which I just absolutely love. There's another spot where one of those associates taps on the Batmobile and said, hey, is there a trunk in here? <laughs> Cracks me up. As, as we're going to stores and um, talking with customers who are experiencing the service, it's, it tends to be moms with kids in car seats, and they get emotional about the time that we're saving them. It's a hassle to get a kid out of a car seat. And our kids were like time clocks. Like at about 28 minutes, they went off screaming. So you had only so much time in the Walmart store to get all this stuff done. So, you know, pickup is great, and delivery is going to be an important part of our business. And um, having an e-commerce food relationship with them is a strength because it gives us time as we're building out the general merchandise assortment and the rest of our e-commerce experience. We've invested in the e-commerce set of capabilities, the site, the app, and, and we've done some cool stuff with voice these days that will exist on multiple devices. And at the same time, we've added over 2,000 brands in the last 12 months, and brands are starting to think about Walmart in a different way, um, where they understand that as in China, actually, with Alibaba and JD and Tencent, there are these big ecosystems that are emerging, and we're building one here in the U.S. that's going to attract all kinds of customers. We already serve basically the U.S. in some categories, and we need to serve them in more categories, including apparel and home. And so that's a big focus for us. And as we're building out that assortment and adding those brands and creating that momentum, we've got this really strong foundation and in some ways an advantage as it relates to grocery being close to people, and we're going to make the most of it. So building an e-commerce business is step two. And step three is strategic positioning. Um, as a company, we have an approach to strategy now that includes you know, the consistency of our purpose and values and clarity around where we want to play and how we want to win, and then a set of critical enablers. And in that where to play dimension, we're making choices about what businesses are we in and what businesses are we out of. One of the things that I've learned is that when you're driving change like this, it requires investment, and you simply can't afford to invest in everything all at once. And because that's a reality, you end up with some parts of your business that don't get the investment they need on the timeline that they need, and therefore, we got to let them go. Just don't be in them. Don't harm them. Just let them go. So you've seen us exit Brazil. We've been trying to merge our business in the UK with another retailer, we're trying to make changes to our portfolio so that we're in the right businesses, in the right geographies, et cetera. As we're doing that, we're also playing offense. And when you see an opportunity like the one that we saw with India and Flipkart, you know, we get excited about taking it. So it's not just about exiting some places, it's about doing that so that you can add and do things in other places. And India is, as you know, an enormous market, an enormous opportunity. GDP is already large and growing, and e-commerce is less than a 3% share. And for some time, we'd been getting to know the leaders at Flipkart and had a high regard for them, felt like they were capable. But really, it was when we started to understand that they are building the future business model of retail as we have been trying to build it, that everything clicked for us. So when you look at this chart, what you see is this is not uh, yesterday's business model. This isn't just buying and selling merchandise. It's creating an ecosystem, a set of platforms that have some network effects. They, they can mutually reinforce each other. So yeah, there's an e-commerce business, and we like the fact that part of that e-commerce business is in the apparel category because the margins help with mix. But there's also a really important payment system with phone pay. There's last mile delivery. There are other capabilities that exist and are being built to round out what you might think of a as a, a chessboard. So in addition to trying win with the customer on price and assortment and service, in parallel, we're thinking about positioning in the world and in what businesses that we're in, and the, the team is moving with speed to help make some of that stuff happen. So step four, and this was definitely not something that I saw coming in the beginning, and I don't, I don't know that many of us did, but today, and I'm sure it'll be more true in the future, we've really started to understand what's possible with what we would call a digital transformation. And I read about that in the news, and I've heard other companies saying it and doing it for a while, and, and I don't think I really understood what it meant. And today, as I talk to other business leaders, I think some of them have different definitions, so all I can do is give you my definition. 
I think what's happening is the aspects of data and tech that are now available to us as tools, as business leaders, are going to determine whether you adopt those effectively or not, um, survival and whether or not you can thrive. And for me, the complication isn't in one area of technology, it's in how they collide with each other. So when you think about all the things that are either already happening or coming soon, you've got advanced data and analytics, machine learning and artificial intelligence, the move to the cloud which has been happening, robotics, autonomous vehicles, blockchain, 5G, augmented and virtual reality and mixed reality. Those things are in some state of being already. And when I try to imagine how they all come together, it's more than I can process. So what we've, what we've learned is, yeah, it's important to understand those things at some level so that you know what they're capable of, but actually the way to think about it is to think about what use cases are you solving for? What are you trying to do for customers, either in terms of innovation, creating things they've never seen and don't even know they need or want, or the removal of friction and solving problems, age-old issues that you couldn't solve before, but now, because of what technology can do, you can solve them. Well, you better do that with speed. So it really starts with changing inside the company how we work, and we've always thought we were customer-driven. I would argue that our future looks even more customer-driven in a way that is much more real and practical, not just emotional, but um, a way of working. So what we're moving to is, is a, a kind of a top-down view as it relates to that innovation and problem solving for customers, where you identify the specific customer journeys or problems that you want to solve, and you work with product management, design thinking, engineering, and other parts of the business to solve them in a faster cycle so that things get done that you couldn't otherwise get done. And at the same time, you're deploying kind of hardware and technology that helps bring the whole thing to life. So some of the pictures that you're seeing here, kind of bottom center is something we call a fast unloader. Um, as Terry mentioned, my first job was unloading trucks, putting merchandise on rollers and shoving it into the warehouse so that it could eventually go to the stores. Well, this fast unloader not only moves the product but sees it and slots it out, whether it's an out of stock that needs to go straight to the floor or a seasonal item that needs to be saved for some certain event. It sorts the merchandise as it unloads the, the truck as humans put merchandise on the rollers. But what's really interesting about it to me is it's starting to talk to other devices in the store. So in the upper right-hand corner, you see a floor cleaner that's now autonomous, roaming the sales floor, cleaning the floor. The interesting part about it is it's got a camera on it and it's seeing what we have featured that's not on the side counter. And the one that's in the upper left-hand corner is roaming the side counters looking for modular accuracy and in stock. And those two are starting to talk to each other to bring the Internet of Things to life in the store so that jobs that associates used to do that frankly didn't enjoy, might have been more mundane, are just solved by the Internet of Things coming to life in the store. And as I'm talking to associates about it, they're pumped because they actually don't do the things they didn't enjoy and now they're on to doing something else. And those training academies can help us get to a point where they can continue to learn and execute. In the bottom right hand corner, what you see is an associate using virtual reality to learn a new skill set. Um, so, you know, we've got everything from, you know, how to deal with a situation where there's an active shooter in the store so that you know you can train associates on how to be safe, to how to stock the veg wall, the, the wet wall in the produce department and get things in the right place. And then you go out to the sales floor and you actually know what you're doing in a way that helps job satisfaction and helps us with retention. So there's this, this digital transformation that's happening. And just to put a fine point on it, I like Rom's de definition here, particularly the part that we've highlighted in yellow. This is what I didn't get in the beginning. It, it involves fundamentally changing the way you conceive of and operate your business. A digital company is, first and foremost, totally focused on the consumer and treats every consumer as an individual. Well, that's a pretty big change for us because we um, believed in the democratization of price and still do. So we believe in everyday low price. It's not a high-low ad. It, there's no manipulation. We're not trying to play games with you. We're trying to build trust. If you come in on Monday or you come in on Saturday, you get the same price and it's as low as we can possibly make it. And because we run it that way, our supply chain gets smoothed out, which helps us lower costs so that we can in turn lower prices more, 
So that productivity loop gets to spinning, and that's what we've been driving these last few years to bring our prices down. So then what does it mean to Walmart to treat every consumer as an individual? Well, in the past, to do that, it was really expensive. And we didn't want to invest in a loyalty program to play games with customers on price. But what we've learned is, is that there are lots of use cases that we can apply that don't fall into the category of high-low sales or couponing that will be anticipatory and help customers save time, introduce them to new items. So now we're working to get our data into a place, and it's not there yet, where we can really put it to work. There, I look at, at Walmart sometimes, and, and we, the other leaders do too, and we just see these huge untapped assets that we really have never monetized. And we're trying to move as quickly as we can to do that. And one of the big ones is putting data to work beyond just trying to keep stores in stock, which is really all we've ever tried to do with data. But I'd, I'd love this, this quote from him because I think he puts the finger on it. Getting from where we are now which is a scale business that frequently operates in silos where merchandising and operations and logistics and marketing and all these areas work independently with specialists who sub-optimize for their breadth of responsibility to this new place where we think more holistically work across these silos and work faster is hard because it requires human beings to change, which I think is the thing I've learned more than anything else is change is all well and good for you guys, but I don't really want to change. Like, I like how I am, I like how I do it, I have a routine. So if we as leaders are not willing to change, you really can't ask anybody else to change. And somebody was playing around with, with watches in one of these change management classes I was in in the past, and they had me take my watch off my left hand and put it on my right hand and try to make it to bedtime. I don't know if you've ever tried that, but it drives, the, it drives me crazy. <laughs> and I can't really make it sometimes. But when I'm, when I'm talking about change, sometimes if I, I'll remember to do that, and I'll take it off my left hand and put it on my right hand. Even that annoys me. So, you know, this human thing about, you know, what's job security look like? What does my, if I'm a student and I'm about to start on my career, should I be in retail? Should I work for a brick and mortar retailer? The job security issue is answered by your ability to change. Either you can or you can't. And if you can't, doesn't matter how old you are, you got a problem. One example of this digital transformation, because it sounds so academic and strange sometimes to people, uh, that I wanna show to you is, is really what I'm talking about, which is this needs to manifest itself in a way that the customers, or in the case of Sam's Club, the member actually experiences something different. So I'm gonna show you something that's frankly embarrassing. And it's embarrassing because it took us so long to solve it. But let me show you what signing up at Sam's Club to be a new member is like inside of our clubs. If we could run that video, we're gonna show you what, what today kind of looks like and what we're rolling out and what tomorrow will look like. So the steps are outlined in that white box. Using simple technology like cameras and an iPad and some software. You can now sign up a member in 46 seconds. And I'm embarrassed to tell you the old way it was like three weeks. Like, can you imagine standing in line for eight minutes for anything? I don't even want to stand in line at Disney for eight minutes to ride a roller coaster, much less be a, I mean, I'm here trying to give you my money to be a member and you make me wait eight minutes? They showed me another application in another part of the business recently, and it's just like awesome. We had our club managers together at our year beginning meeting, and they were literally oohing and oohing and aahing like they were watching a fireworks show with some of the new stuff that's coming out that digitizes the stores and the clubs. So digital isn't just about e-commerce. Digital is about the entire organization changing how it works in the way that I described a few minutes ago, and I'm, I'm super pumped about it. So step five relates to what I was saying a minute ago about Flipkart. Um, Flipkart looked to us like the chessboard that we have been playing with on what the new business model looks like for a company like us. And we believe that, that this ecosystem definition here, which is a network of mutually reinforcing, those are probably the key words, mutually reinforcing businesses that, that help each other. They help each other to serve customers and people better. They help each other, therefore, to drive the top line. And they help you manage the bottom line in a different way so that you can make investments where you need to make it. Now, I, 
got an MBA and I was taught there in an undergrad the power of focus and was given books to read telling us, you know, it, there's power in focus and I know the story of Sears and what Sears did to differentiate. Um, but what feels different to me today, and, and I think we gotta be really smart about it, these choices matter a lot, but what feels different to me today is that data is a thread that runs through everything and parts of tech do. And given that, the picture starts to look a little different to me where there's a, a life and a customer in the middle that is surrounded by not only data and technology, but people. Back to the very first step, we're a human company. We're, we're about people. We're not a, actually a tech company. We're people-led and tech-empowered. That doesn't mean we don't have cool tech. That doesn't mean we don't have great engineers and great data scientists. We do, but we also care about people, and it's a people-first business. So when you come into contact with a Walmart associate today and tomorrow, we want you to have a really human experience where, you know, when you're walking to an item in the store, if that's the case, they're talking to you about their day and they actually care about you. That's what we're trying to achieve. But build businesses around the outside of that set of relationships and connection points that not only have stores and we got to run the best stores, that's our strength, that's our advantage. The stores have got to keep getting better and we have ideas on how to continue doing that but then build a first party, party e-commerce business with you know, speed and at scale, build out our marketplace so that it's better than it is today and we got a lot of room to improve there. And then last mile logistics, health and wellness and other components of this can be built on top of that strong foundation that we have with people and build a business model that enables Walmart to be here over time. I do think this is easier to say than to do and as I mentioned before, there are a lot of choices in front of us that we're you know, trying as a management team to do the best job we can with to get them right. I don't think we'll get them all right. I'm sure we haven't gotten all the other decisions we've already made right. But if you can get a few of these big ones right, you're gonna have a business that's here in the future. Just one last thing for fun. As it relates to the advantage that we have and the one in the US in particular we're trying to make the most of now, it relates to grocery and fresh and perishable be, being in stores so close to people um, we're within five miles of 70% of America, 10 miles of 90% of America. So like 15 minutes drive time, we're like really close to just about everybody except, the, except New York. Um, as we think about what we can do with that, the idea of Walmart as a service starts to come to mind where some of the things that you've always done, you just don't have to do anymore. Um, I was telling the students earlier that we were visiting with that when Shelly and I got married, we had Heinz ketchup in our refrigerator, and I know when we die, we're gonna have Heinz ketchup in our refrigerator. Um, it's a different configuration because the bottle is geniusly turned upside down now, which it should have been a long time ago. But other than that, it's the same stuff. And now I feel a little frustrated when I go to a Walmart store or Sam's Club and I have to pick my own order on things I buy all the time. Now I'd like to go to Walmart and Sam's Club and walk around and see what's new, and I do like to get out of the house sometimes. Um, but I don't wanna to have to do work that I don't actually have to do. And with technology in the future, we don't really have to do that as customers. So let me, let me show you something that's kinda of like showing you a concept car. If I was Mary Barr at GM, I'd be showing you this. Could we run that video? <sighs> I'm completely empty. and they don't care. They're gonna do their mother-daughter weekly matinee thing because they know everything is completely under control. They can see how completely easy this is. I'm completely taken care of. And we're all completely fulfilled. Oh, this is pretty great. So if we offered that to you today with an annual membership fee, how many of you would want it? Yeah, yeah that's interesting. 
You know, uh, it wasn't very long ago, maybe it was this morning, somebody said, that won't work. Nobody's going to let you in their house. And there are lots of issues with going in people's homes, obviously, and there are a lot of micro problems that have to be solved to manage this well, because it's hard enough to manage in stock and 11,000 stores managing in stock and tens of millions of homes will be hard. But we're breaking those problems down and we're working in this direction and we've got some pilots going on. We're in our second uh, small testing phase right now and um, the customers are responding to it very positively. And the number one complaint we have so far is that the strawberries aren't fresh enough which is the number one complaint we have pretty much, period. <laughs> so some things don't change. Our former CEO, David Glass, when I see him almost every time asks, are you still working on in-stock? Don't you have that solved yet? And I'm like, nope, we don't have that solved. But the idea of doing it in this scale is a whole different, different problem. I don't think everybody's gonna do this, but I do think this continuum of service, if you wanna come shop in the store, you can. We'll have the best store you, you can find. If you wanna do pickup, we can do that. If you wanna do delivery, we'll, we can do that. If you wanna have delivery, but not into your house, but into your refrigerator in the garage, and a lot of people have refrigerators in the garage, we'll figure that out. And then over time, more and more people will probably say, hey, just go ahead and take care of everything for me. And in our little pilots, that's what's happening so far, is that people start out saying, I'm kinda of freaked out by this but because of all the little problems we're solving, they're moving towards, why haven't I been doing this all along? So retail's gonna change a lot. Some things like culture, purpose, <laughs> managing in stock, those things are gonna last forever, but a whole bunch more is gonna change. And what the current leaders at Walmart are trying to do is to create a culture such that the problems that need to get solved after we're gone still get solved because it's just a problem solving culture. And I think that's ultimately the skill set adapting to change, developing the ability to problem solve, uh, solve problems is ultimately the skill set that we're all working on and in retail in particular it happens at a fast pace which I find thrilling. So that's all I've got other than I think I've got a few minutes left to answer questions if anybody wants to ask one. Somebody please tell me when to stop. Okay. Doug, I have a question for you right here in the center. Doug, thank you. Hang on. That, that's, that's a tremendous, uh, I won't call, I'll call it a laundry list, I guess, of initiatives that, that you just enumerated and, and uh, it echoes things that we've been hearing in the market as well. So here, here's a, a question that I think is probably poignant for you in your position. How are you and, and the company managing the complexity of handling all of these initiatives at the same time. And do you have any, I guess, sort of higher level thoughts about what that means for a business leader? Because it's not getting simpler for Walmart, even though you're scoring some pretty nice wins of late. Um, so, so what are your thoughts about that, sir? I'm hoping all this isn't printed in the, or put on the internet, um, so I'll just trust can be pretty open, but there are times our heads want to explode. Like this is a lot. And the thing that we're kind of perpetually working on together, and I am blessed to work with an incredibly talented team. I've got, we have got a great team. Um, and the thing that we're now working on all the time is force ranking priorities. Because there are more new ideas than, that we have than we can execute. And not only are we coming up with them through our associates, but people are walking through our doors with incredible ideas. I was in Israel last, last couple of weeks and I spent um, a good amount of time last week seeing dozens of new startups. And it's not just obviously there, it's here and it's everywhere else too. There are new solutions that you can apply all the time and they're all good ideas. I had this really good idea recently and I went over to a member of our team and said, hey, I think we should do this, that and the other. And they said, yeah, that's like the 18th best idea I've heard all day. <laughs> And they're right, because they told me the other 17. I mean, it was like, there's a lot of good ideas. So the ability as a leader to figure out where do you draw the line, how do you sequence things. We have a lot of resources in terms of people and cash flow, but we do not have limited resources and we can't do everything. And we've got the short term, long term pressure and the top line, bottom line pressure to juggle as we try to create you know, this shared value for all stakeholders. So 
it's not easy. You better have great people around you, and you better make a lot of good decisions, even though some of them will be bad. And when they're bad, kill them early and move on to the next one and don't worry about it too much. And Sam had that characteristic too, by the way. We, we had a lot of failure when Sam was here, and I hear stories about him waking up the next day and having forgotten we even did it, and he's on to the next one. Having a short memory is good. Uh, on the right over here? Over here on the right. I got you. Oh, that was great. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about your grocery section. So I know obviously grocery is Walmart's biggest business category and with your initiatives to move um, more so for e-commerce and grow that e-commerce channel, I was wondering if whether you and Mark have considered um, utilizing the partnership with Uber and Lyft that I know you've had in the past to um, help fulfill, like using localized fulfillment since you're close to 90% of the consumers with online orders for grocery with last minute delivery to help with the consumer pain of consumer willingness to have groceries delivered and maybe using that to combat um, maybe a pushback from the new initiatives that you guys have of people coming into the stores and delivering it straight to your refrigerator. Yeah, that's a great idea. And the partners that we're using the most from a platform point of view, the independent contractors that are closest to us are DoorDash and Postmates, but around the country there are many others, and we also have our own independent contractor platform called Spark that's in test in some markets right now, and we also have a pilot going on with associates delivering. We, we love this idea, although it's, it's harder to execute than it sounds, and, and I don't know if it'll work, but we love this idea of, of paying associates you know, all of their hours and providing health care and letting them go home from the store and dropping off a couple of orders on their way home to make extra money. We'd rather that extra money go to our associates than to an independent contractor, and we love the fact they have health care. Um, there are challenges to that idea, but we're testing that as well, and we'll be persistent as we try to, to figure that out. So the sum total of all of that will mean that by the end of this year, 60% of the U.S. will have uh, grocery delivery, so we'll reach geographic coverage through independent contractors. Now in China, we're doing it with an investment in a last mile delivery company called New Dada, which we own a minority position in. And in Latin America, Mexico and Chile, we bought a company called Corner Shop that does grocery delivery that picks up from our stores and goes to the home and that business is growing very quickly. So we know it's an, obviously a no brainer that food delivery, both grocery and restaurant is huge. And it'll, it's just gonna be the way people live in a big way. We, we think the stores as profitable pick centers have a long life. Um, and it's important to learn how to pick really efficiently so that, efficiently so that's true and, and that's what we've been working on. The stores become hybrid dual purpose stores. And we have another question here in the center. Thanks. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk about um, the success of your pickup towers that you've added to the stores or any learnings from them? Yeah, they've been great. Those big orange towers have a really high net promoter score. Um, they, they work, they're reliable, and they save people a ton of time. And they, they work for non-food. So we're trying now to put one on the outside of our stores to see if we can use it as a drive up. We're playing around with that. And someday we may have them even off property. Oh, right here? Over here. Oh. Over. Gotcha. Um, thank you for coming. I live here in Tucson and I'm involved in real estate. And I noticed that here in this state, uh, Walmart is building fewer stores. And in fact, I've heard that they are planning to close a few. Do you see your company going in the direction of, say, continuing to expand and building more neighborhood markets? Or do you think your company will start um, doing this distribution model where you order your groceries online and then they get sent out by, from a warehouse? Is that an unfair question? No, no, it's fine. Um, we've got a, a store portfolio that I think may have reached 11,600 units. Um, maybe I'm going back like maybe six years ago now because I was still an international and we, we have more stores outside the U.S. than we have inside the U.S. And we started a process to go through and look at every one of our store locations in every country, regardless of the format, and look at its financial performance and also other characteristics, including its potential. And we started closing the stores that we felt like were, were going to 
um, harm our ability to invest in other businesses. If you're carrying stores that lose money forever, that's a resource strain that keeps you from doing other things. So we started in China and we closed some stores in Brazil and we've been refining that portfolio. And then in the US a few years ago, we closed some stores. We closed an express format and we closed a few super centers and we closed a few neighborhood markets. And then the last pit piece was the Sam's Clubs. And so now we're down to 11,200 stores and we are closing a few stores here and there around the world, but generally the portfolio is in really good shape now. And as I mentioned before, we're trying to learn how to make many of them fulfillment centers, and that seems to be working. So if I had to forecast in the future, um, we're still building new stores and there'll be a net gain to our new stores for years, but most of that gain will come from outside the United States where we have a store format that really makes sense in a particular country. And in the US, we may have a net gain, but we're not gonna go back to building hundreds of stores again. Fulfillment centers for food, we do in the UK and um, some forms of them in other markets, some higher costs than others, in some places more automated than others. So we have a continuum of learning as it relates to what fits each circumstance depending on the volume of demand. So it would be my guess that in the US there will be more food automation with fulfillment centers in the future, but for a really long time there will be a whole bunch of Walmart super centers that are the very best way for us to pick economically because of their locations and their capabilities. So like many of our other things, back to the point about complexity, this will end up being not a binary yes or no, it'll end up being a number of solutions that fit a circumstance. Last question. And then we have a One final more. question right here in the front. Thank you. Um, this is a bit of a layup uh, question, Doug. I, uh, I own an executive search firm and uh, I was down in Bentonville last September and I got to go to an executive search uh, summit that uh, Amy Goldfinger uh, put on. And, uh, and I came back to New York and I told my uh, staff, I said, uh, I said two things. Number one, this is not your grandmother's Walmart. It's really an amazing, amazingly different group of uh, people and thinking. And secondly, I said, uh, they, they don't really believe in DNI, um, which is diversity and, and inclusion. I, I said, they don't believe in it, they live it. And uh, I was so impressed with what I heard that day. And they all said that it came from Doug McMillan and it started at the top. So I'd like to give you an opportunity to talk about how important that topic is and how you're um, bringing that topic across the globe to Walmart. Well, you're, you're kind, I think that's partially true. <laughs> um, it's, it's all of us and we got a long way to go and I'm, I'm not, okay with where we are at the moment from a DNI point of view and definitely on a journey here in this country and in others. And I, I believe, and I bet most of you do too, that the solution to the future involves creativity and innovation and that requires diversity of thought and that requires literally diversity of people. And um, you know, we operate all over the world now in all these different countries and have home offices in Tokyo and Mexico City and varying levels of, of DNI uh, being woven into our everyday culture. And in the US, we, we wanna make more progress with leadership and, uh, and throughout. Having so many associates means that you look like the United States and you should look like the United States from top to bottom with compensation, with everything that you do, whether it's gender or anything else. And so what we've been doing the last few years is, is that we've learned that experiences and stories make an impact more than programs. So we've done things like I've led a group on a couple occasions to Montgomery, Alabama to have an immersive experience learning from people who went through the civil rights movement, hearing stories, seeing things, experiencing things firsthand and it changes them. Seeing things from someone else's perspective. So there are a lot of things happening that would fit into kind of old school training and experiential things but the thing that's made the biggest difference is just taking people places and showing them things and letting them experience it for themselves. But there has been some positive recognition for the company, but I would just tell you we got a, a long way to go. But I appreciate the question and the comment. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me, Terry.